Okay. <clears throat> Welcome back. Uh, this is L4 uh, in medical biochemistry. I'm Dr. Correa. Uh, this is on thermodynamics and chemical equilibrium. Um, this is a pre recording for a, a lecture that I'll be giving live on Tuesday, August 11th um, at 1 p.m. Um, okay. So, the objectives for this lecture are to define what we mean by an equilibrium constant and then describe standard state free energy, delta G naught, and its relationship to an equilibrium constant. We'll show um, and derive the expression delta G naught is equal to minus RT ln K, where R is a gas constant and T is degrees Kelvin. We'll explain delta G as being a criteria for spontaneity. Will a reaction move forward as written? And it will have an enthalpic and an entropic component. Hmm. Okay, is my pen not working? It is working. Got here. There we go. An entropic, enthalpic, and entropic component. Uh, and then we'll do some examples of how you calculate delta G and delta G naught given quantitative data. What that means is concentrations of products and reactants. And then at the very end, we'll discuss what happens when reactions are unfavorable and how you make them proceed anyway. So we're talking about coupling favorable reactions with unfavorable reactions to make something become a favorable reaction. Okay, uh, most of metabolism is unfavorable. Most of the synthesis that we do to make up all of the macromolecular components in our bodies cost energy. How do we do that? Okay. When we eat food, how do we convert that into usable energy that we can then use for all of the stuff that biology does? Okay. So let's start with chemical equilibrium. Um, at equilibrium for a reversible reaction, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Okay. So if you write the overall rate uh, the overall reaction down here is A plus B going to C plus D. At equilibrium, the, the loss of A, the ADT, is equal to the loss of B, the BDT, because the stoichiometry is one to one. So every time you lose an A, you must lose a B. And the products are formed in the opposite rate. So if this is being lost, this must be gained, and so minus dc dt, but that must also be equal to minus dt dt because the stoichiometry is one to one. So if the stoichiometries were different, then you would have to have different stoichiometry coefficients. Now at equilibrium, a small change in A is balanced by a small change in C, and overall these changes are zero. So there are minusculely small changes going on at equilibrium, okay. So what do we do when we wanna write this down in a quantitative way, all right? So what we write down is that the equilibrium constant is a function of the ratio of products to reactants, all right? And so we'll derive this by starting with something involving rate constants. For example, if A and B react to make C, then there's a forward rate constant. This is actually a bimolecular rate constant because there are two species reacting. And there's a, for, a reverse rate constant involving C going back to A plus B. So there's a reverse rate constant. It's actually a unimolecular rate constant because C is one concentration. So at equilibrium, the forward rate, the constant times the concentration of A times B is equal to the reverse rate the constant of the rate constant times the concentration of C. If we rearrange this, okay, and we leave C and divide by A and B, this is our definition of an equilibrium constant. It's the concentration of all of the concentrations of the products divided by the concentrations of the reactants. 
So it's C over A times B. But in rearranging this, we ended up with a forward rate constant divided by a reverse rate constant. We brought A and B to the right and K, R to the left. So the equilibrium constant can be described by a ratio of forward to reverse rate constants. In this lecture, we're only concerned with equilibrium processes. So we're only going to be concerned with this overall process as written here. Okay. <clears throat> so we're talking about thermodynamics today. Okay. And so there's a couple of things that we're going to just jump in and define. All right. So the first thing is, is that thermodynamic state functions that we're interested in are the enthalpy, the entropy, and the free energy, okay? And what we mean by a state function is, is that they tend to be path independent. They really are the final minus the initial, okay? Where do you go to, where do you come from? And so the delta H, the change in the enthalpy for a chemical reaction is the final minus the initial enthalpy. And that would give us the definition of delta H. So enthalpy, as we're defining it here, is essentially the heat generated by the chemical reaction. So the enthalpy of the system is the heat generated by performing this chemical reaction. All right. The entropy is also a state function. We could write this down as S2 minus S1. It's the change in the entropy. The way we think about the entropy, we'll say this a couple of times in this hour, it's a function of the possible states of the system, okay? Another way of saying this, the way it, that people like to talk about this, is the randomness of the system or the disorder of the system, <clears throat> okay? A way that I prefer to talk about this is the possible states in terms of let me count the waves, which is a measure of disorder or randomness. So one of the ways that you can think of this is if we were in a room, which we're not, and all of you were sitting in chairs, which we are not, and there were 170 of you, but there are 200 chairs in the room, how many different ways are there to arrange 170 people into 200 chairs? So if there were 200 of you, there would only be one way. But since there's 170 of you, there's lots of ways to to kind of arrange you in the room so that it's a different configuration. So that is actually a measure of the entropy and it's one of the ways that we actually calculate the entropy. So randomness, disorder, number of ways of rearranging things, possible states of the system are all different ways of saying something about the change in the entropy. In general, it's known that the entropy of the universe is becoming more random but in select environments, like in the environment on the Earth's surface with the sunlight and the generation of all kinds of order in the system, we have order going on. And so the entropy is not actually getting more disordered. It's getting more ordered in different parts of the Earth. Okay. Um, this could be said and maybe is better said if we talked about it in terms of the human body and the order that goes on in the human body as we make different structures. G is the Gibbs free energy, or the free energy, again, final minus initial. It's the change in the Gibbs free energy delta G that we're talking about, okay? And the value of delta G is, is that delta G is a measure of the spontane spontaneity of a reaction. Will it proceed, yes or no? Okay, so it turns out that a reaction will proceed, okay, will proceed, as long as delta G is negative, as long as delta G is less than zero. It doesn't mean that it will happen quickly necessarily, but it means that it will happen, okay? So how do we determine whether a reaction is spontaneous or not? It turns out it's some function of the enthalpic and entropic contribution. We'll talk about that, okay? So if we were to do this in a very systematic way, which is, or something we're not, we would initially define something like the internal energy, and then we would define something like the enthalpy, and then, and then we would define the delta G, and we would find that this would be the simplest definition that we would give, that G is equal to H minus T delta, TS, okay? 
And we would know that G decreases during an approach to equilibrium, going from state one to state two, if G reaches some kind of minimum at that equilibrium point. If it reaches a minimum at some point, going, and the way we're going to draw this in a second, is we're going to go from one state to another state, and we're going to go downhill. There might be some barrier to going downhill. So we might go to, from state one to state two, but the change will be downhill, and so it will be a negative change. The delta G will be negative, and this reaction will be spontaneous, okay? And so if we think about it in terms of this, there'll be an enthalpic and an entropic component. And if we do this at constant temperature, there won't be a change in temperature. There'll be a delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Okay. So we can say in general then that the change in the free energy, negative T minus G2 minus G1 is less than zero, means that the reaction as written is spontaneous. As we'll see, it also implies that the reverse reaction is non-spontaneous. Okay, so we write this down in general, and this is taken from the Lippincott's book. Uh, it looks like it's figure 6.1. That delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. The change in the entropy is a measure of randomness, but it alone does not predict whether a reaction is spontaneous or not. It's just one of the components. And the enthalpy is a measure of the heat released or absorbed. And again, it alone does not predict the spontaneity. It's only delta G that predicts the, the spontaneity of the reaction, predicts whether a reaction is favorable. It tells you something about the available energy for doing work. Uh, it approaches zero as the reaction proceeds to equilibrium. There's an enthalpic contribution. There's an entropic contribution. And it's the delta G that will predict the favorability of a reaction. So you should just be familiar and know that equation. Okay. Now, there are a couple of the terms that we can use. Okay. So in general, if delta G is negative, favorable, Another way of saying this, it's exergonic, okay? So delta G negative, exergonic. Delta G positive, endergonic, okay? This is terminology you see in many uh, biochemistry textbooks. This favorability or unfavorability comes from enthalpy and entropy contributions. So <clears throat> what can we say about this? Well. If the enthalpy is less than zero, then that is an exothermic reaction, okay? The enthalpy contributes favorably to the free energy. The enthalpy change is negative. Then it's exothermic. It gives off heat, all right? But notice that alone does not determine the sign of G. The sign of G is determined by what's also going on with delta S. So if delta S is positive, remember it's minus T delta S. So if delta S is positive, then T delta S is positive and minus T delta S is negative. This is negative. This contribution minus T delta S is negative. And so overall delta G is negative. But down here, if T delta H is negative, but delta S is also negative, then it's minus a minus. And if T is big, so that the product T delta S is a big positive number, then that will overcome and dominate. And this process will be unfavorable. The delta G will be positive because the T delta S term will be a minus a negative number, okay? With high T, the T delta S term will be bigger than the delta H. The minus T delta S term will be bigger than the delta H, and this will be overall positive delta G. Alternatively, delta H can be positive. Those would be endothermic, okay? Endothermic mean you have to put heat into the system. You have to put energy into the system, all right? 
So if delta H is unfavorable, delta H positive, that doesn't mean that delta G is unfavorable because the delta S also contributes. So if the delta S is positive and T is high, then minus T delta S is negative. It's a bigger number than delta H and the overall free energy is negative. So this can dominate over an unfavorable enthalpy to give you a favorable free energy. If the enthalpy is positive and the entropy is negative such that minus T delta S is positive, positive, positive contribution will give a positive free energy. Okay. So favorable or unfavorable free energy will come from enthalpic and entropic contributions. And it depends on whether it's both enthalpic and entropic or neither enthalpic or entropic, whether it's only enthalpic or only entropic. Okay, so it depends on what the signs are of these two contributions. Okay. Now, we also need to define something called the standard state free energy. So standard state free energy is the free energy at something called a standard state. In biochemistry, this is usually 25 degrees C. That's 298 degrees Kelvin. It usually is done at one molar concentration. This is not a very physiological concentration, but it can makes a convenient calculation. It usually is done as one atmosphere of pressure. <clears throat> okay, most of the biology that goes on around us occurs in this environment at surface, uh, surface of the, the ocean. So it's approximately one atmosphere of pressure. Okay, and then because it's biochemistry, we tend to talk about stuff at neutral pH. We don't talk about the hydrogen ion concentration at one molar. We could, but then it would not be delta G with this little bit dagger up here, okay? That little dagger usually refers to a neutral pH. All right, so the standard state refers to conditions that are at one molar. Now, what does that end up meaning? Well, the standard state is the standard state change in free energy under standard state conditions. That is not the same as the overall free energy because the overall free energy is the free energy observed under the actual conditions in effect. In other words, under the actual concentrations, all right? So delta G will determine the spontaneity, not the standard state free energy, and that will be rele re relevant or dependent upon the concentrations relative to the standard state concentration. So let's see what that's going to mean. So this restates what I've just said. Spontaneous if delta G is less than zero, equal to zero at equilibrium, greater than zero if it's not spontaneous. And in this case, the reaction won't proceed unless there's some other energy source, a driving force for the reaction to proceed. So this is a coupling reaction we're going to talk about at the end. Okay, so here is this in sort of a, a uh, progression of the reaction plot. Uh, this is also taken out of your book. Here's a reaction A going to B. This is plotted as free energy versus progression of reaction. Here's initial state A, here's final state B. There's some transition state or activation energy that we'll talk about on Thursday and Friday. So if this reaction goes downhill, if the free energy of B is less than the free energy of A, then this reaction has a negative free energy and this will be a favorable reaction. But if we look at this by turning the reaction around, B to A, now we're going uphill, okay? And the, the initial state and the final state is turned around. Now delta G is positive. Now this back reaction is unfavorable. So if the forward reaction is favorable, the back reaction is unfavorable, okay? That's sort of a, a truism. Um, Generally speaking in biology, generally speaking in metabolism, um, not all reactions are reversible. Not all reactions can go backwards, but many of them can. Many of them can go backwards and many of them can go one way under some conditions and the other way or the back reaction under other conditions. You'll talk about this during the metabolism portion of this course. 
Okay, so a lot of metabolism actually is under reversible control, equilibrium control. Okay, now we, we want to make this a little more quantitative. And to make this a little more quantitative, we're now going to introduce logarithms and natural logarithms. So in the pH lecture this morning, or in the other pre-recording, we defined uh, pH as minus the log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So if the log of A is X, then you should know that the anti-log of X is 10 to the X. So you can get A by taking 10 to the X. So we were doing this going from the anti-log back to a ratio of the base over the acid in the henderson hasselbalch equation, all right? So you should be familiar with this sort of manipulation. If log, X, log A is X, then A is 10 to the X. We're gonna introduce natural logs. Okay, so if the natural log of A is X, then A is E to the X, okay? And so this is similar, but there, it's not exactly the same. <clears throat> the only thing that I would add to this here is that 2.303, 2.303 log of X, is equal to natural log of x, okay? So you should be familiar with this relationship because I'm gonna have you use this relationship in solving problems. <clears throat> so the connection between natural log and log is this 2.303, okay? So you can actually equate these or calculate <clears throat> what these are relative to one another, okay? So here's the overall equation. We're not going to derive it. If you wanted to derive this, we would actually start with something called a chemical potential for each of the products and each of the reactants. And we would write that down as a chemical potential standard state. And we would write that down involving an RTLN concentration of that particular reactant or product. And then we would sum all of these up over products going to reactants, reactants going to products, and then we would use this chemical potential sum to get delta G and chemical potential standard state to get delta G naught, and RTLNCs to produce this overall reaction, okay? So this is where this derivation comes from. R is the gas constant, T is absolute temperature. So what you need to know is that the free energy is a function of the standard state and the concentrations of products and reactants, all right? So if you raise the concentration of reactants, you can make a reaction more favorable. If you lower the concentration of products, you can make the reaction more favorable. There are things that you can do with this ratio of products and reactants to change the sign of the delta G, and that's really what we're interested in. So at equilibrium, by definition, delta G is zero, okay? And so we can set delta G equal to zero and then set that equal to the delta G naught plus RTLN products over reactants. But we're now at equilibrium. And therefore, this is the equilibrium concentration of the products and this is the equilibrium concentration of the reactants, okay? So what that means is if we rearrange here, delta G naught can be brought to the left in doing that, we can just change the sign. So delta G naught is minus RTLN, products at equilibrium divided by reactants at equilibrium. This is a definition of an equilibrium constant. Is this, if this was just A going to B at equilibrium, as we were writing up above, at equilibrium, okay, then that would be a definition of the equilibrium constant. All right, therefore, delta G naught, the standard state, is equal to minus RTLN, the equilibrium constant, the natural logarithm of the equilibrium constant. So this is a definition, and this is something that you need to know. I wrote this down in the objectives up above, and I'll write this again down below. All right, so again, the criteria for spontaneity is delta G, not delta G naught. Delta G is negative zero or positive, depends on the exact concentrations of reactants and products. All right, so we're gonna do some calculations now to drive this message home. 
All right, now I'm in a PDF. <clears throat> so normally when I bring this slide up in a, uh, a PowerPoint, we do these one at a time. This is taken from your book, okay? And so you could look in your book and there's a discussion of this in your book. And so we're gonna do this successively. In this panel at the top, non-equilibrium conditions, A is 0.9 molar and B is 0.09 molar, moles per liter, okay? And A and B here correspond to glucose 6-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate, okay? So this is a reaction that goes on in glycolysis. And so it's simply showing you in the jar here, in the beaker or in some hypothetical environment, we have a concentration of A to B. This is non-equilibrium, so it's 0.9 and 0.09. So what can we say, all right? So the way this is given is it says, under these conditions, delta G is minus 0.96 kcals per mole. 960 calories per mole, okay? So it gives us concentrations. We can blog concentrations in here. The B is 0.09, that's the product. And the A is 0.9, that's the reactant, okay? Those are molar units. Okay, so we know what delta G is, and we know delta G naught plus 1.987, that's R, times 298, it's not saying it here, but this is at 25 degrees. The natural logarithm of 1 over 10, because this is 0 0.09 over 0 0.9, that's 1 tenth. Okay, so that's the log of 0 0.1. So if you multiply this all out, take the logarithm of 0 0.1, that's minus 1, times 2.3, we've now converted natural logarithm to log times 2.3. So did you see that? I did it up above, but there it is again. The natural logarithm is 2.303 times log. So this is minus one times 2.3, and then I multiply together the 198, 1.987 and the 298. And so if you multiply this all out, you get minus 1363 calories. And I've changed the units here to calories. So this is equal to minus 960. So if you pull this to the right and you solve, delta G naught is 400 calories per mole. So giving you this and giving you the overall delta G, it allowed us to calculate delta G naught. Okay. So under standard state conditions, A is one molar and B is one molar. That's the de definition of standard state conditions, okay? So under standard state conditions, delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT ln one over one. So the natural logarithm of one or the logarithm of one is zero, okay? So this term cancels because it's zero, okay? We already know now from above that delta G naught is 400 calorie per mole. So under standard state conditions, delta G is equal to delta G naught equals 400 calories per mole. Now the problem then makes you calculate something else. It says, okay, knowing that, what is the equilibrium constant? Well, up above we showed that delta G naught is minus RT ln K. So if this is 400, then we can do a calculation. We can bring 1.987 to the left. We can bring in temperature to the left. And so it's minus 400 divided by 1987 divided by 298. And it's the natural logarithm. So if we raise this to the E power, that will give us the value of the equilibrium constant. So if you do this math, you will see that the equilibrium constant is 0.5. All right, so you could have also written this out as 2.303 and then divided by 2.303, but then you would have raised this to the power of 10, okay? So you could have rearranged that in a slightly different way. Okay, now in this third box, it's equilibrium conditions. So notice A is 0.66 and B is 0.33. Notice it's B over A. 0.33 over 0.66 equals 0.5. These are equilibrium conditions. The concentration of fructose 6-phosphate over a glucose 6-phosphate is 0.5, okay? 
So now what we're calculating here is if we put in the equilibrium concentrations, and that's what we were saying above, the delta G is determined by the conditions under which you are working. So if we put in equilibrium concentrations, 0.33 product over 0.66 reactant, this is the natural logarithm of 0.5, which is a logarithm of a half times 2.303. Notice I did it again here. <clears throat> we made a substitution here. So delta G is delta G naught. We just determined up above it's 400 plus 1.987 times 298 times 2.303 times the log of a half. If you multiply this all out, you're going to get minus 400. So notice minus 400 plus 400, delta G is zero. So at equilibrium, delta G is zero. So you can see what happens here. To be at equilibrium, the concentration of A and B plugged into this part of the equation offsets the standard state term so that the sum of these two terms is zero so that delta G is equal to zero at equilibrium. So this whole series of calculations is something that you should sort of be familiar with because I'm gonna make you do problems like this in the exam. All right, so let's do another example. Uh, let's say we have A plus B goes to C. So the equilibrium constant for this is C over A times B. And I'm gonna tell you that the equilibrium constant is 0.0475. So the question initially is, what is delta G naught? So you now know this formula. Delta G naught is minus R T L N K. That's the K. Plug it in. R is 197. T is 298. Natural logarithm of this. If you plug this in and do all of this math in your calculator or wherever else you do this, you'll get 1,800 calories per mole. You'll get 1.8 kilocalories. All right? Now, the next question is, if... A equals B, and that's 20 millimolar. And if C is equal to 2 times 10 to the minus 6, that's 2 micromolar. Okay. The question is, what's the free energy? Is the reaction going to be spontaneous? So what they're really asking us is delta G negative. Okay. So the equation is delta G naught plus RT ln, concentration of product divided by concentration of reactant. So it's 1,800 or 1 1.8 kcals per mole plus R times T times the natural logarithm of 2 micromolar divided by 20 millimolar divided by 20 millimolar. If you do all of this math, you take a natural logarithm, you multiply this, you sum it all up, you get a negative value. You get negative 1,330 calorie per mole. You get minus 1.3 kcals per mole. So the answer is delta G is negative. So the answer is the reaction is spontaneous at these concentrations. So even though the delta G naught is positive, these concentrations make the reaction spontaneous. So I said this a little while ago. There are multiple ways of doing this. You can make the concentrations of the reactants high. You can make the concentrations of the products low. You can help to drive the reaction by sort of favoring high concentrations of reactants, low concentrations of products, so the reactions will proceed favorably in the direction as written. Okay. So biology tends not to be thermodynamically favorable. Metabolism is generally not favorable. Making biological molecules, making complex biological structures is an unfavorable reaction. It takes energy. So how do we accomplish it? Well, we eat food, we break that food down into building blocks, and we break those building blocks down into energy resources, and then we couple those energy-containing uh, molecules to unfavorable reactions, and we make those reactions favorable, okay? And so one of the ways we do this is coupling favorable reactions with unfavorable reactions, okay? The other way we achieve this is the principle of mass action, and this is sort of what I was saying above. If the concentrations are such that you force a reaction to be favorable, if you make the product concentrations really low, then the reaction will proceed. 
So one way of doing this is if you use the products as the reactants in the next step, and so you bleed them off, then that will continue to cause the reaction to go forward. So let's write this down as a general principle. Okay, the overall delta G of a reaction is the sum of the free energy changes for the individual steps. So imagine if we had a reaction, A going to B plus C, and the overall free energy, I'm not giving you any of the details, is five kcals per mole. But then if reactant, if product B went on to make D, and that reaction had a delta G of minus eight kcal per mole, then the overall reaction, if you just sum this, the B is on both sides, so it cancels. And so A goes to C plus D. The overall free energy for the overall reaction will be the sum of the free energies. Remember I said that delta G is a state function. It depends on end products. It doesn't depend upon paths, okay? And so if this is a plus five and this is a minus eight, the overall reaction is minus three, okay? Thermodynamics is just arithmetic. You simply sum these two and you couple a favorable with an unfavorable reaction and the overall reaction becomes favorable, okay? In this case, it's done through a common intermediate called B, okay? Now, biochemically, the way this is often done is to favor, decouple reactions to a favorable reaction like the hydrolysis of ATP. ATP can be broken down into ADP plus PI. The delta G naught is minus 7.3 kcals. And so we can couple these unfavorable biosynthetic reactions to this strongly favorable reaction. All right. So pictorially, your book shows you a couple of things. It shows you this coupling of um, pulleys, wheels, okay, a favorable and an unfavorable reaction. All right. And so this is able to let a reaction go, and this is a reaction that can't proceed, but that if you couple these pulleys together, okay, you can use one of these reactants that is favorable, the green one, to drive a reaction that's unfavorable. <clears throat> Chemically, that means we're going to cleave bonds. So, for example, in the case of ATP, we're going to either cleave this terminal beta-gamma bond, or we're going to cleave this internal bond, this alpha-beta bond, and we're going to cleave off phosphate or pyrophosphate. And both of these are what we call high energy bonds, and they can be coupled to make reactions favorable. So this is one of the things that we could use. Okay. Another couple of depictions and another discussion of what can be used to couple reactions. So another book, a biochemistry book by Leninger shows this sort of mechanical example, which I like better than the wheels and pulleys example up above. Imagine you have an unfavorable reaction. A box needs to go up an in plane. You couple it to a favorable reaction, a big box going down an in plane that will pull this box up the hill and it will make this overall forward reaction. Okay. Notice endergonic and exergonic terms are being used here greater than, less than zero. Chemically, the way this looks is, imagine we have a reaction, glucose being phosphorylated to make glucose 6-phosphate. This reaction is unfavorable. It takes energy. It goes uphill on a progression curve. But if we couple this to ATP hydrolysis, which is going downhill, then it's this reaction summed with this reaction, the sum of those two reactions is this, it's glucose plus ATP going to glucose 6-phosphate plus ADP. Notice the phosphate is on the left, the phosphate is on the right, it cancels in the overall reaction. And so this now becomes the favorable reaction. The favorable reaction is the sum of delta G1 plus delta G2. So this is essentially how it gets done. Now we're talking about ATP here. But this is not the only reaction that occurs in the body, okay? There are lots of other favorable reactions, some of them with only a small amount of energy. The glucose 6-phosphate we're making here can actually be used subsequently to, to favor other reactions. Or there are other phosphorylated forms like creatine phosphate 
or carbamyl phosphate or phospholeno pyruvate, all of which have large negative free energy changes that can be used to couple reactions, all right? <clears throat> now notice this is using negative delta G naughts as though this is what's gonna be coupled to the reaction. It's still the concentrations of reactants and products that really ends up being overall favorable. It's not just delta G naught, it's also the concentrations of products and reactants. So this is a typical question that I've asked a lot over the years. Standard state free energy change for ATP hydrolysis is minus 7.3 kcals. Under cellular resting state conditions, the mole ratio of ATP over ADP is 100, while the PI concentration is constant at around 1 to 5 millimolar. So now I'm going to give you specific examples. In an exercising muscle, this ratio can drop. What if the free energy change for GTP what is, excuse me, what is the free energy change for GTP, for ATP hydrolysis? If ATP is 5 millimolar, ADP is 0.5, so notice the ratio has dropped to 10, and the PI is 10 millimolar, okay? We need to plug these concentrations into our overall equation. And notice, this is an RTLN, so what I'm telling you here to do is convert ln to 2.303 times log and then multiply 2.303 times rt and you'll find out that that's equal to 1.36 kcals per mole when i do this live i'll try to remember to say that earlier and so the adp is 0.5 millimolar that's 0. 0.0005 the pi is 1 millimole is the pi is 10 millimolar excuse me 0. 0.01 the atp is 5 millimolar 0. 0.005 so this ratio logarithm times 1.36 added to minus 73 equals one of these numbers okay and so you can do this on your calculator you can sort of see that the fives will cancel and they'll cancel out, this will cancel out, this will cancel out, the fives will cancel. We'll end up with 0.1 here. 0.1 times 0.01 is 0.001, that's 10 to the minus 3. Okay, The log of 10 to the minus 3 is minus 3. Minus 3 times 1.36 is minus 4 something. Minus 4 something plus minus 7.3 is approximately 11.4. I think it's 11.38 if you calculate this out. So this is what you need to know how to do. You need to know how to put these concentrations into this equation, take the log, add it to the delta G, calculate what the overall free energy is. So yes, it's minus 7.3 under standard state, but under cellular conditions, it can be much more favorable. There can be much more of a driving energy for this reaction. Okay, so how does this coupling occur? It doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It just doesn't happen in ATP is floating around in a solution and it phosphorylates glucose. It has to have some kind of a medium, some kind of a direct physical link, all right? How the formation of glucose 6-phosphate from glucose and phosphate from from, that has to be corrected, as a positive delta G naught, it can be coupled to this reaction. And the medium is the enzyme active site. In the active site of hexokinase, the reaction facilitates the transfer of the phosphate directly from ATP to glucose. This is achieved by the proximity in the active site. They bind to adjacent sites on the enzyme. Catalytic groups within the active site facilitate the cleavage of ATP in the formation of a phosphorylation site on, kind of, on the glucose, and this makes the overall delta G favorable, okay? So this is a picture of the structure of hexokinase, okay? So here's the ATP binding site, here's the glucose binding site. You can see the, the phosphorylation site is close to the triphosphate site, and that's what facilitates the reaction, okay? And you can read some words out here that facilitate this. Notice different kinases have different reaction pathways and they can be more or less favorable. This is discussed here in terms of 
what's going on in the liver versus what's going on in the brain. We'll discuss that in more detail. No, nope. backwards. Okay. So example number two for coupling. Uh, the principle of mass action. Acetyl-CoA plus oxaloacetic acid goes to citriol-CoA. The standard state free energy is near zero. Then that citriol-CoA goes to citrate plus coenzyme A. And this is a favorable reaction if you just look at the standard state, minus 8.4. Okay, so if you couple these two reactions together, the overall reaction will become favorable. And so if you keep the concentration of citriol concentration low, then it will pull this other reaction forward, okay? And pull this reaction forward so that it will make the citrate coenzyme A and it will overcome the unfavorable reaction. So both of these reactions are catalyzed by the same enzyme, the citrate synthase. And so as soon as you make the citriol CoA, it reacts to break down into citrate and coenzyme A. So, so, so there's a physical justification for how this reaction proceeds, okay? And so this particular enzyme binds the, the, uh, the first two substrates and then makes a intermediate that can, goes on to a product. And it favors the binding of the first two substrates before it allows the second reaction to proceed. There's actually a conformational change that facilitates this. You can read this text to see what I'm talking about. Okay. Now, when you have multiple substrates, there are different ways that you can buy, combine substrates. And that was basically what I was just saying. The first two substrates basically react before the third substrate can react. And so there may be specific pathways. Maybe A and B react before B and C react. And maybe different pathways are more favored than other pathways, okay? And so that differentiation, which is selected for by making conformations available for some substrates, but not other substrates, favors the overall chemistry as it's written, okay? So there may be an, what's called an ordered addition, okay? And that's what actually happens here in citrate synthase. All right, so in that particular case, the downhill is favored, but there's a path dependence to the downhill. And so maybe one path is more favorable than another path. And I think this is color coded to mean this path above is more favorable. Uh, is, is, in this case, this, this path is got a bigger activation energy than this path. And in this particular case, the lower activation energy gets favored over the higher activation energy. And so this path may be more favorable simply because of a transition state difference. We're writing this down as actually a conformational change in the enzyme that favors one path over another path. Okay, so pathway one has greater, uh, greater favorable energy. The activation energy is larger for the other path. And so the pathway one becomes more favorable. Okay, both reactions are spontaneous. But reaction two goes faster because the, rea the, the reaction activation energy is lower. Okay. This color coding is what I need to make sure I discuss. Okay. So, um, not all reactions in biology are at equilibrium. So, that's sometimes a consideration. Sometimes there's a kinetic regulation of this. Products disappear. Not all reactions are reversible. And then sometimes the environment favors reactions in ways that we can't understand in terms of just test tube reactions. So the crowded environment in a cell or interactions with other molecules in a cell can make reactions favorable. The way we'll talk about this in our enzyme lectures is organization and enzyme complexes that favor overall reactions. Okay. Uh, so one final point to make here, that uh, thermodynamics is useful for understanding mechanisms. What biochemistry is about is metabolism, the conversion of energy from one form to another form. And so thermodynamics is useful for understanding coupling reactions 
and how they favor the metabolic pathways that we're talking about. Um, we often talk about this in terms of enthalpic and entropic processes. And so this is part of what's going on in biology and in metabolism. But we can use this in lots of other ways. For example, enthalpic and entropic processes are applied very often in the development of drugs. Okay? And so the stability of drugs and the binding of drugs to their active sites often involve trying to make favorable enthalpic or favorable entropic contributions to favor stability of drugs, stability of binding reactions that might make those reactions um, useful for drug activity. So here's a summary of a lot of the things that we went over. You should know this equation, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. You should know that standard state is minus RTL and K. You should know that free energy is delta G naught plus RTLN products over reactants, depending on what the stoichiometries are. You should know that this RTLN can be reduced to 1.36 log. Spontaneity is the sign of delta G. It must be less than zero. And reactions are made favorable by coupling unfavorable reactions to favorable reactions. Okay, so I'm at 51 minutes now, and so I can't keep going. There are some questions here at the end that maybe we'll get to in the live lecture, and we certainly can get to during reviews uh, later in the course, okay? And so I'm going to stop there at 51 minutes. This is a pre-recording. Um, and we'll do these kinds of uh, reactions later, but in this time frame, I'm, I'm doing this to sort of practice how quickly I need to go to do this in a live setting. So I'm gonna stop now. I'm gonna hit a button over here that says end the meeting. This will be posted somewhere so that you can look at this instead of the live recording or in addition to the live recording.